looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them sing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. <coughs> the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Tee, 
and you can smack it anytime you want to. I feel like I'm that age and I'm facing, you know, Nolan Ryan or Tom Seaver, one of those major league pitchers. How in the world can I accomplish anything that way? Well, you are probably familiar with Johnny Erickson Tata, uh, beautiful young woman who uh, dove off a diving board when she was 17, hit her neck just the wrong way, became a quadriplegic. She's, uh, you know, in a wheelchair 24-7. One time, according to a worship uh, magazine article, she was in a worship service where everybody was asked to kneel in prayer. She could no longer get out of that, uh, that wheelchair by herself. She would have to be lifted out of the wheelchair. But she also could not kneel because she couldn't hold her body up. And so she began to sob quietly to herself because she really did want to kneel with everybody else before her Lord in worship. And through her tears, she prayed this. She said, Lord Jesus, I can't wait for the day when I shall rise up on resurrected legs because the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fall to grateful, glorified knees and worship you. Well, I have a test for worship. Does it, does worship, whatever we do and however we do it, here and anywhere that we take part in worship, does it come from the heart? There's, there's question number one. Question number two, and do we recognize that it can never be enough? Whatever we do, is it ever going to be enough in terms of ascribing to God who He is? Worth sharing. The third question, do we offer our best despite the inadequacies of who we are and our human condition? And then lastly, are we in worship service to be pleased by a choir, as good as they say, a soloist, as good as the soloist might present it, a pastor preaching a maybe a neatly constructed and cleverly presented sermon? Are we in the worship for the entertainment value, the fact that we are to be pleased by what's happening, or are we there, are we here to please God and bow before Him and like the angels circling the throne in Isaiah's vision, cry, holy, holy, holy. Why are we here? <clears throat> well, there's a true story of a young boy who complained to his father that the church was boring. The church hymns were boring and old-fashioned. The tunes and the words were so out of date. They, were, uh, they meant very little to his generation. So his father challenged him. He said, listen, if... They're boring to you. If you can write better hymns, why don't you do that? And the boy did it. He went back to his room, and that night he wrote his first hymn. The year was 1690, and the boy, that young boy, was named Isaac, Isaac Watts. You might recognize the name because more than 350 hymns later, Isaac was still writing. And we're still singing his tunes. Uh, some of the names appear on the screen there. Joy to the World. I mean, do you enjoy singing Joy to the World? When I survey the wondrous cross, O oh God, our help in ages past, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, am I a soldier of the cross? One of my favorites is, we're marching to Zion. Marching to Zion. Um, Isaac Watts wrote that, it, so goes the story, when he was the pastor and the choir director. Imagine that, Debbie, he had my job and your job. Right? <laughs> Uh, he wrote that song one Saturday night because he got wind. Uh, the unity in that particular church was terrible and it was just about broken altogether. And the choir was a cohesive group and the choir was going to refuse to sing the next Sunday morning. And so Saturday night, Isaac Watt took pen in hand and he wrote this hymn, We're Marching to Zion. That's the one that starts out, Come we that love the Lord, right? I mean, you, that's a familiar hymn that we sing all the time. He wrote that song, and it has this as its second stanza. Listen to the words. Remember the circumstance. The choir was going to revolt. They had a problem. And this is the second verse that Isaac Watts, the pastor and the choir director, put in. He said, let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. <laughs> so, you suppose they were on the hook with this? I mean... Did that choir have a little situation going on? Let those refuse to sing. What would happen if they refused? 
What would happen if it was their prerogative not to sing? And they took that prerogative. They would be saying, let those refuse to sing who never knew it. They're saying, well, we're not going to sing. We don't know that, God. You think the message was received? Well, the music, the prayers, the offering, the sermon, the scriptures, you know, nothing about any of that is optional. None of that is about protest. None of that is about personal prerogative. What is it about? It's all about total surrender. Total bowing before Almighty God. It's about falling down before a holy God and a striving worthiness to Him. That's worth shit. We can do no better than just submit ourselves. That is holy worship. Some folks will only come to church to be baptized or married or buried. Dr. Adrian Rogers, that old Baptist preacher who's with the Lord now, used to call that being hatched, matched, and dispatched. <laughs> he said that the first time they throw water on you, the second time when you're matched, you know, they throw rice on you, and when you're dispatched, they throw dirt on you. <laughs> well, people that got to be dragged to church have the same attitude as I've seen in the comic strip, The Family Circus. I don't know if you like that comic strip. I love it. Written by a Christian man, Bill Keen. But, uh, one of the characters in that comic strip is Dolly. She's a little girl. And in this particular one that I love, she is sitting next to her mother in church. And she has a very bored expression on her face, counting the tiles on the ceiling. And she's looking at her mother, and she says, how much longer till we go with home? <laughs> well, friend, when you come and you stand in the presence of Holy God, the transcendent, the King of glory, the resurrected Lord of all, somehow the thought of how long is this going to take? Or are the Baptists going to beat us out to the cafeteria? <laughs> These things ought not to be. So what I want us to do is look at the character of the God that we came here to worship. And the first uh, piece of his character that I'd like for us to consider is his holiness. Consider the holiness of God. When Isaiah had his eyes open in his vision to see the glory of God filling the temple, he saw the angels flying back and forth. And what were they crying? Holy, holy, holy. <coughs> the angels in heaven can do that. That's the least we can do. Uh, Isaiah's reaction when he saw that was to shrink away because Isaiah knew himself. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I can't say what I'm seeing here. That's too holy for my mouth. God is different from man. He's beyond description. You know, standing before Almighty God will change your perspective on life. Amen to that? I mean, if you've never wilted in the presence of Almighty God, you've never stood in the presence of Almighty God. Paul wrote in his second letter to the Corinthian church that he'd been lifted up to the third heaven like Isaiah before him, like John, the apostle, his contemporary. Paul could not utter appropriate words to describe what he'd seen. How unspeakable, how wonderful the ways of God. Words sometimes fail us. You remember Marco Polo went to, uh, he's, he's not just a game, by the way, right? He's an actual historical figure. Marco Polo in the 13th century, he went to the East and uh, uh, on his deathbed, I mean, reports of his discoveries were not believed by everybody. He had a tough time once he got back home. He discovered the, the trade route and, you know, that is legendary, but what happened when he got home? Most of the people didn't believe everything that he said about it, about the wonders that he found over there. And on his deathbed, he was urged by some to recant, to withdraw all that he told about the wonders of China. Do you know what his reply was on his deathbed? I mean, do people tell the truth on their deathbed? They, they, they generally do. He said, I have not told half of what I saw. That's the truth about worship. I don't think that we can come anywhere near half of what the holiness of God is. But listen, it's up to us to try. It's up to us to keep stepping up to the plate, so to speak. Secondly, I'd like to consider His majesty. Besides His holiness, there's His majesty. In the chapter before Elsie read, uh, she read in chapter 5, in Revelation chapter 4, we see saw these... Uh, bits and pieces of crowns and beasts that speak of the royal nature of our God. 
And uh, some people throw this stuff off and they say, oh, I don't understand that, so I'm just going to close the book and I'm not going to think about Revelation. That's too, too complicated. But listen, let me explain just a little bit about what these uh, beasts speak about. We have many faced beasts. They look in all different directions and they're different faces. One is the face of a lion and it represents the nobility of who God is. A second is the calf and that represents the strength of who God is. Then there's the face of a man on a third side of the beast and that indicates wisdom. And then there's the face of an eagle to complete the 360 degrees and that represents grace and speed. And in the fourth chapter of Revelation you have 24 elders bowing at the throne. Now these 24 elders are the leaders in all the ages of worship to God the Father around the throne. And where do we get 24 from? Well, in the Old Testament, how many tribes of Israel were there? There were 12, weren't there? And in the New Testament, how many apostles do we have? We have 12, don't we? And so these 12 in the Old Testament, 12 in the New Testament, incidentally, what is the dividing line of all history? Is it not the cross of Jesus Christ? And so Old Testament is everything before the cross. New Testament is everything after the cross. You realize we're living in New Testament times even now? But these 24 elders... 12 tribes of Jewish nations, 12 apostles of the New Testament, these elders, the leading leaders of the worshiping community in every age, what do they do in heaven? They take off of their crowns, which are the symbol of their earthly authority, and they lay them before the foot of Jesus, Almighty God, the only truly majestic one in the bunch, King Jesus. His holiness, we can't say. But His Majesty, we must least, at least, point to giving our authority to Him. It doesn't make any difference if you're Billy Graham, who, who was one of the greatest evangelists of our time, or if you're a murderer on death row who's converted at the very last moment. There will come a day when every one of us will stand before God and we will have the option to give an excuse why we didn't worship Him, or we will have the presence of mind and heart to take off whatever we have ever done in His name and lay it at His feet. Not a wrong thought to begin to practice that here and now. Folks, that's one of the things we're going to be doing throughout eternity. We're going to be worshiping God throughout eternity. We better practice that now. Our worship ought to include bowing before God. I think sometime, I think that Methodists simply don't do that because maybe the Catholics are. You know, we don't want to be like that other group, and so we're not going to bow. But you know what? We're going to be doing that in heaven. The elders are going to lead the way, and we're going to do that as well. We're going to bow before God. We're going to lay out prostrate before Him. Holy, holy, holy. All the saints adore Thee. So says the Scripture. So says the song. Casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. So consider His holiness. Consider His majesty. But thirdly, consider also his uniqueness. We live in a very dark world. We live in a time that is evil, where evil is so prevalent in our society, it tries to push Jesus to the side. It tries to trivialize the gospel. Once again, let's go back to the worship scene in Revelation chapter 4. When John looked at the throne, he noticed there was room for how many on that throne? John said when he turned and he saw there was one sitting on that throne. What is the picture of Jesus and the Father around the throne? Jesus is standing at the right hand. He's not sitting on the throne with God. He is standing at the right hand of God. So many people have tried to include Jesus in their life. They try to make room for him, among other things. The reality is that that's a sad picture of people making room for Jesus in their life. The fact is Jesus is life. And He is our life. This is, a, this, this is a, something that we need to remember. Jesus said it Himself, I am. He said to Mary and Martha, He said, I am the resurrection and the life. You know, if life includes what we do, physically breathing, you don't make room for breathing. You just do it, don't you? It just is something that is part of who you are. And if you don't do it, what happens? Then you've got the other. You've got death. There is another lesser throne. 
than God's throne. It's the one in each of our hearts. Um, the problem is that there's only room for one on that throne as well. The throne is the symbol of authority. And in your life, your throne is your heart. It is the symbol of your authority over yourself. Now, God has given that to you, hasn't he? We are free agents. Don't we have moral choice? Don't we have the choice before us whether to love God or not to love Him, to serve Him or not to serve Him, to sin or not to sin? God has given us that right. We have that right. The point is, in each of our hearts, there's only room for one on that throne. And if we take authority over our own lives, if we call our own shots, the problem with sitting on that throne ourselves instead of letting God sit on that throne is that the responsibility is too big. Matter of fact, it is so big that the shadow that it casts will block out any view of God. If you take over the authority of your life and say to God, I'll do what I want to do, you block out any vision of God. The Old Testament story of Jacob illustrates this. Jacob, as you know, was second in line to his father's estate. So what did he decide to do? He wanted to be first in line. And so he decided to take matters into his own hand. He sat on the throne of his own life. He wanted to call the shots. And eventually, you know the story, he messed up so bad that he had to leave the very place he called home. Twenty years later, he's returning home. But he's still the same Jacob, although he's had 20 years to think about it, although he's had 20 years of experience to see what sitting on the throne of your own life can lead you to. And so that night, as he was about to come back home, about to see his brother once again, the brother that he had offended and he had to leave home, that night he wrestled with the angel of the Lord. Some say this was a theophany. This was an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament and the angel that Jacob wrestled with was actually Jesus. But whether it was Jesus or whether it was an angel, uh, we do know that Jacob wrestled with him all night long. That must have been one fight. I never saw John Wayne in a series where, you know, he, John Wayne would fight with the guy for about a half an hour, right? You know, they would have a slugfest. I don't know how they stood on their feet if they were really fighting. They uh, obviously weren't. The point is, though, Jacob wrestled all night long with this angel. And there was something physical about it because his hip got thrown out of joint in that. But that night, Jacob finally settled who was going to sit on the throne of his life. He said to the angel, I'm not leaving this place. I'm not letting go of you until the matter of who's going to sit on the throne of my heart is settled. And in that pre-dawn struggle, Jacob got himself off the throne of his heart and he allowed God control. He said to him, life or death, I don't care which it is, but we're settling this thing right now. And once Jacob <coughs> got himself out of the way, once he got himself off of his heart's throne, then he could see the glory of God. Then he could see the uniqueness of the one who is supposed to be obeyed and worshipped and glorified. Consider his holiness, his majesty, his uniqueness. One more, consider his mercy. Consider the mercy of God. We, uh, we know that the only thing that can truly evoke praise or true praise is mercy. The mercy of God is something that should and does evoke praise praise from us. It's only, it is said, it's only the saved sinner who can look back and see that he deserved hell and was handed heaven. Isn't that a glorious thought? That you deserved hell and you were handed heaven. Wow. I, Russell, deserve hell. God has offered to hand me heaven. And all I had to do was say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Is that offering worth ship? Is that considering His mercy. What has God been merciful over? Well, creation was an act of mercy itself. God's patience over sin is an act of mercy. Have you, ever, have you ever wondered in your own life why, considering some of the sins that you've done, that God didn't just kill you right there? I mean, you know, if, 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 we, uh, if we're honest about this thing, we know that sin brings forth death. Doesn't the Bible say that? 
Look, look at the book of James sometimes. It says this specifically. Sin, when it has fully grown into its fruit, brings forth death. So, why didn't God just kill me? Because He's patient. He is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, the Scripture says. God's patience over sin is an act of mercy. And God's Word, which reveals Himself, is an act of mercy, uh, is an act of mercy itself. And the cross was the supreme act of mercy. The question then becomes, what do we do about His mercy? What do we do about His mercy? We praise Him. We praise Him. The Bible tells us uh, in very many ways, in specific ways, how to praise Him and why. First of all, praise is our purpose. 1 Peter 2.9 tells us, For you are a chosen people, your royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For He called you out of the darkness into His wonder, wonderful light. See, the purpose that we have as Christians is to show God's goodness to the entire world so that they'll respond as well. That's what it means to be a witness. It means say what God has done for you. Secondly, it is also our privilege. Psalm 63, 67 verse 3 says, May the nations praise you, O God. That is a privilege to praise God, to lift Him up before the world. And then it's also our priority. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse uh, 15. The writer says, Therefore let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God. That speaks of a priority, to proclaim our allegiance to His name. Now, if the God of all mercy could come to earth and die and go to hell and suffer the penalty for our sins, what an incredibly small thing it is for us to turn around and praise Him for it. That's our response. Be so merciful. Elizabeth uh, played a song for uh, the offertory a few moments ago. I don't know if you've ever heard it or not. It's not an aria. No, it's in the Baptist hymn. And I, I've always loved this song. It's called Worthy of Worship. And uh, as she was playing it, I was singing the, the words in my head. And, uh, and the words go something like this in the, in the chorus. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory. Worthy of all the glad songs we can sing. Worthy of all the offerings we bring. You are worthy, Father, Creator. You are worthy, Savior, Sustainer. You are worthy, worthy and wonderful. Worthy of worship and praise. Boy, I'll tell you what. Every time I used to sing that song, I, I break out in that song sometimes when I'm driving down the road when there's nobody in the car that can criticize me. So. And I, I lift that song, not that she does. I mean, if I hum, she says, what's that awful noise? But uh, I, I've got a bit of a test for us at the end of this message here this morning. The test is this. What are you going to do about what you've heard and experienced here this morning? What are you going to do? Will there be any difference about the way you spend this week? When we consider His holiness, when we consider His majesty, we consider His uniqueness, we consider His mercy, what are you going to do in response to that? Will there be any difference in the way you spend this week when you consider His mercy? Paul Rees wrote this. He said, if you can leave your church on Sunday with no feeling of discomfort, with no feeling of conviction or brokenness or challenge, then for you, the hour of worship has not been as dangerous as it should have been. You know, whenever I come to worship, when I truly am in a spirit to worship, I realize that my life is on the line. Everything about my existence is on the line. Richard Foster followed up Paul Reed's statement. He said this, If worship does not change us, it has not been worship. Folks, if you're comfortable in your relationship with God, evidently, you haven't worshipped. Because you can get awful uncomfortable in a holy, magnificent, unique presence Merciful as it is, 
of Almighty God. A couple of questions to you on. Are you challenged to live in worship this week? Are you different because you've been here? What will you do in response to the mercy of a holy, majestic, unique God who has been and has shown to you mercy? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let the church say, Amen.